Okay, well, um, it's 4.30. Um, I, and people are starting to come back in. Um, I guess I will uh, introduce John, who will be talking to us about getting started with ARC persistent identifiers. Um, John Quincy is a pioneer in the theory and practice of digital libraries. A former Berkeley Unix hacker, he created the ARC persistent identifier scheme and was a major contributor to the first URL and metadata standards and to the Bagot and Work web archiving formats. I don't know if I said that right. Um, welcome, John, and uh, feel free to get started whenever you like. Thank you, Susan. Um, again, my name is John Kunze, and this course was developed with Johnny Winston, who won't be presenting today. I'm a computer scientist who has been working with data centers, libraries, museums, and archives for the past 20 years. And in this, this presentation uh, will include examples from each of those sectors. In case you're wondering, a persistent identifier serves the same purpose as a permalink. It's meant to persist, but there are no guarantees. So we're talking about URI or URL identifiers that were aspirationally persistent when created. Apologies that because of the online format in this normally interactive tutorial, we will hold the interaction until the questions and answers uh, at the end. Why should we care about ARCs? The average lifetime of a URL was once said to be 100 days. At the end of its life, a URL link breaks, usually giving you the dreaded 404 not found error that most of us have seen. While that can be irritating, it's a minor disaster for memory organizations. Whoops. Um, so ARCs can serve as robust links for any kind of thing in any discipline. The ARC scheme is one of um, five so-called- Sorry, John, to interrupt. Uh, we were wondering, um, are you showing, are you sharing slides right now? I am, oh, apparently not. Uh, let me, uh, that was an oversight. So let me, uh, yeah, let's go back then. Yes, we can see your full screen slide. All right, um, let's, go, let's go back. Apologies for that. So, um, so where was I? I guess so. Arcs can serve as robust links for any kind of thing in any discipline. The arc scheme is one of five so called persistent identifier or PID schemes. There's been a great deal of nonsense written about PIDs. Some of it is described in a Twitter thread called 10 Persistent Myths About Persistent Identifiers which is available at the link using this example arc or the QR code next to it. PIDs are permalinks containing hints that make them look different from the average URL link. Every URL, every URL is potentially persistent, but strangely, some people think it becomes a PID when it acquires some superficial syntax differences, such as the arc colon in this example arc, or when you see the domain name doi.org at the start of a URL. Syntax is neither magic nor a guarantee. It's never more than a suggestion that you might find this link to be more stable than the 99% of URLs that are produced without a thought for preservation. So-called PIDs break often and by the hundreds of thousands, which is a normal part of providing a preservation service. Committed service providers will repair some of those links. So syntax doesn't make it persistent, but it may suggest that you're looking at a permalink, whether or not it's displayed next to the label permalink. So this nonsense was in full bloom in the late 1990s, but it polluted the debate about the four or then proposed PID schemes. That's why the archival resource key or ARC identifier scheme was introduced in 2001. Here's what an ARC looks like. At first sight, it's a URL that carries this internal label. To the right, the five-digit name assigning authority number, or NAN, 
identifies the organization that created the ARC. Further right after that number is the local name of the thing that the ARC is assigned to. To the left, the host name makes the ARC actionable or something you can click on. It's also known as the resolver. ARCs are unusual among kids in allowing organizations to run their own resolvers. The part starting with the ARC colon is the core globally unique identity. It does not depend on the host being available or on the future existence of the World Wide Web. In the previous example, you saw n2t.net, which is a global name to thing resolver. n2t is the main ARC resolver. So why doesn't it contain the letters A, R, and K? Well, one goal of the ARC design was to break out of the silos and walled gardens surrounding many identifier systems. So what got built was the name to thing resolver or N2T. The domain name N2T is good for short citation strings and true to its name, N2T also resolves hundreds of different identifier schemes. So uh, another big benefit of N2T uh, is that uh, as it resolves all these, these 900 so-called compact identifier types, um, it means you, you can forget where the resolver is for, say, ISBNs or protein data bank identifiers or DOIs or even ARCs. Just remember n2t.net. Not only does it remember for you, but it reduces the reliance on individual host names. And at the same time, it saves visual real estate and citations by displaying just the compact ID. ARC organizations include a wide variety of memory institutions, nonprofits, for profits, data centers, and government agencies. Few are listed on this slide. At the lower right is another example ARC identifier, which you can recognize by the signature ARK colon inside it. This one points into the collection of the Louvre Museum. What are ARCs used for? Here are some examples. The biggest ARC user is the Family Search Genealogical Research Organization. Next is the archive of source files for journal content published in the Global North. The Internet Archive has been assigning ARCs to scanned books and texts since 2008. Uh, the French National Library was an early adopter, and there's a wonderful image uh, depicting the biblical ARC, and of course, it has an ARC. ARCs are also important for people, especially historical figures, for example, 19th century mathematicians Ada Lovelace and James Maxwell. Maxwell do not have ORCIDs, but they do have ARCs. ORCIDs are open researcher and contributor IDs, and these are like ORCIDs for dead people. Finally, there are several projects assigning ARCs to uh, vocabulary terms. Here's a brief case study from the French National Institute for Scientific and Technical Information. Their reserve NAN is 67375. On the right is one of its 22 million records, in this case, an entry from the SAGE Social Science Thesaurus. Inside the red rectangle, you can see the ARC they assigned along with its NAN. Note how this ARC URL begins with their own resolver, not with N2T. That's because it's an option to use N2T. It ends with an opaque string that tells us nothing about what it's assigned to. But we can tell from the metadata in the record that it's assigned to a conceptual thing. Here's a brief look at how ARCs are implemented at the Internet Archive, whose reserved NAN is 13960. On the left is a library standard that was digitized and deposited in the text archive. On the right is its metadata record. Inside the red rectangle, you can see the ARC they assigned and its five-digit NAN. This shows the compact form of an ARC because it has no resolver in front of it, just the globally unique identity. In contrast to the identifier field above it, the ARC is opaque, which helps it age and travel well for external citation, even if it's awkward for backroom administrators. You can see a bunch of metadata above that, including two URN identifiers that came in with it. Having multiple identifiers may not be ideal, but it's common. 
and probably good practice is to preserve all the identifiers that you have. As persistent identifiers or PIDs or permalinks for information objects of any kind, ARCs are non-paywalled durable web addresses uh, which help protect our collective investment in linked data. ARCs are decentralized in the sense that they don't depend on domain names, but each contains a globally unique identity independent of that domain that is currently, uh, of the domain that is currently serving them. Unlike fee-based PIDs, such as doi.org and handle.net, or, and unlike uh, other domain name centralized PIDs, such as pearl.org and w3id.org, ARCs flexibly support the four rules of linked data. Uh, there can't keep track of all the rules, but there's rules one and two. Um, decoupling them, ARCs are expressible as compact URIs or as HTTP URIs. And even in the former uh, non-resolving case, recipients can still learn which ARC assigning authority created the name. Every URL is potentially persistent, but um, as we said, um, the, the syntax um, differences don't actually help that situation. So PIDs are really uh, just permalinks that may be recognizable uh, in the wild. Um, no guarantees, of course, um, but one of the primary tools for keeping things persistent is uh, the, the technique called indirection. So with HTTP redirection is how it's done these days. So the idea is that you publish your indirect identifiers at a server or resolver that can redirect. So this is a reminder for many of you that a core PID technique uh, of, of the core PID technique for indirect identifiers using uh, HTTP redirects. So first, here's normal direct access. A user clicks on a URL in a web browser, which sends it to the web server appearing at the beginning of the URL, and a page is returned and rendered. With indirect access, the first server contacted says it doesn't know where the thing is, but it returns a message saying that this other named server should have more information. Behind the scenes, instantaneously and unknown to the user, the browser restarts the process by contacting the second server. It could be a third server, fourth, fifth, etc. This is normal web redirection. It's like forwarding snail mail to a new address. Many of our ordinary web accesses involve chains of multiple redirects, all taking place quickly and without the user being aware. All PIDs are very similar in structure. Near the bottom, you see what arcs look like. And above it, all the other PID schemes really have a very similar form. They all start with a resolver. And there's a something I, what the arc calls a name assigning authority, and some of the other schemes call simply a name authority. And finally, uh, there's a local name. So unfortunately, no PID scheme helps with any of the major causes of broken links. So you may ask, why use PIDs at all, especially if there is a fee to use them? So one reason to use them is so that the recipient of your PID knows that it has a higher chance of resolving than the average URL. A PID found in the wild signals the presence of one of these aspirational links. Uh, so it's, it's like any of permalink, but if, it, if the link got separated from the label that said persistent link or persistent identifier, and you just find it in the wild, this helps you to recognize it. Every web server since 1992 can redirect URLs to keep them stable, but only if the original server that the URL is based on still exists. If you think your server's domain name might not persist, you might be able to use a server that is, shall we say, aspirationally persistent so that links can continue to be redirected. That's the second thing that PID schemes offer, namely an aspirationally persistent server that might exist longer than your own server. 
Examples are web servers at doi.org or n2t.net or hdx.handle.net. If the original server no longer exists and you might still be able to update redirects on the aspirationally persistent server, um, you're, in, you're in decent shape. Of course, any longstanding library or archive or any consortium or professional society could set up their own web server very cheaply. In fact, they do it all the time and agree to use it as uh, to redirect their own kids. Either way, this only works if, and this is a big if, if the identified content still exists, if someone or some organization can say they have it and they have the legal right to make it available and if they are hosting it online. Here's a short history of PID schemes. The Perl scheme fully embraced the URL. Just use URLs that we redirect for you. Meanwhile, URNs, DOIs, and handles got confused for a while, at first saying that all URLs are bad, until they later reversed that position and fully embraced the URL. Turning to the inventor of the web, he said basically, just use URLs and manage them carefully. The ARC approach agreed and said, go ahead, use URLs, but embed a recognizable label to suggest that this URL is meant to be persistent and include a globally unique identity that doesn't depend on the domain name and on today's web protocols. So quick review, here's the, the grumpy old person view of PIDs. Looking at this table, the big block of no answers in the first four rows tells us that no PID scheme helps you with all of the major causes of broken links. So why bother? Well, the bottom line may be about costs. Uh, and if they're free, uh, there may be more money to spend on the real work of preservation. If you buy into the idea that PIDs provide value, here are some details on things they might do for you. By an amazing coincidence, this table is quite flattering to ARCs. Again, the bottom line is about costs. Um, you'll note that no organization pays for the right to create ARCs, PERLs, or URNs in unlimited numbers. In the real world, or maybe just the academic world, PIDs that publishers use play a key role. When tenure and promotion hang in the balance, DOIs are the publisher's solution and they are seen as a kind of badge of academic legitimacy. Pearls uh, happen to be free and are common in the semantic web. URNs are useful if you're a national library in a nation that subsidizes URNs, and they have the unique advantage of having an internet standard behind them, even if it is frequently abused by creators of quite bogus URNs. Handles are popular in certain European projects and have a nicely replicated, replicated resolver infrastructure uh, also used by the DOI system, so they can be good if, if you can afford them. If you only have a if you only have a couple dozen things to identify in a year, by all means consider going to zenodo.org and assigning their subsidized DOIs. In summary, ARCs are similar to DOIs. They're both persistent identifiers for accessing content and metadata, and ARCs are found in many of the places where you'll find DOIs. In contrast, ARCs come with no fees, no limits on how many you can create, and no metadata requirements. From the beginning, ARCs were designed to be decentralized and to identify any kind of thing, digital, physical, or abstract. Finally, it is important to note that there is no conflict using both ARCs and DOIs at the same time. This is quite common, for example, You'll find a mix of both at the Smithsonian, British Library, and many other national libraries. Some outfits assign ARCs to everything, and for the subset of things that are later going to be published, they assign DOIs, um, where the DOI string can even be derived from the existing ARC string. Here's the uh, Smithsonian use case, their, uh, their NAN being 65665. You can see that NAN appearing at the beginning of each arc um, and the wide range of object types, biological specimens, paintings, photos, and sculpture. Note the long opaque 
names they've assigned, which were generated using the UUID software uh, that's pre-installed on nearly every platform. These unique names are very long, unfortunately, and they're, but they're easy to generate. Very briefly, here's a, another view of the ARC syntax. It shows more detail than last time. Uh, right now, I just want to highlight the role of the NAN or a name assigning authority member. The NAN is a five digit number. As such, it is opaque, which is good for longevity. But what if you want to know what's behind the opacity? Well, in a browser's address bar, you can try truncating an arc so that it stops after its NAN, as shown in the yellow highlighting. This is a stub arc. If you hit enter after this, after this incomplete arc, it lets you inspect the 12148 NAN. You can also try this with other NANs. Um, note, however, there's a, a as a resolver, that as of a resolver upgrade June 24th, this feature is temporarily not working, uh, but we can see it on the legacy version. All the NAN results that you can see by playing with the stub arcs in the address bar are pulled from the main NAN registry. This is just a plain text file that you can look at directly in your browser. You can also use the QR code if you're interested. Here's what it looks like when you ask N2T to tell you what the 12148 NAN is. You get the record for the National Library of France, as well as when it was registered in 2005. Very, very importantly, it tells you where the N2T resolver should redirect incoming arcs so that they get sent to the correct local resolver. So the NAN has two main purposes. It's a lookup key for the resolution reference point, and by defining the root of a global namespace, it isolates an organization's autonomy and responsibility for assigning its arcs. That way, without interfering with anyone else's assignments, an organization can determine its own policies regarding identifier form, uniqueness, and reuse. Basically, just as for URLs under its domain, its own domain name, an organization can freely assign ARCs in any way that it wants. Here's a link to the form you can use to request a NAN for your organization. If you want to practice using it, go ahead, just indicate in the final comments that you're filling it out as a training exercise. A great deal has been written uh, about opaque identifiers, which age and travel well. But they can be confusing because they reveal nothing about themselves to the user. One approach uh, to soften that inconvenience is to at least make them shorter and therefore a bit more citation friendly. The downside is that shorter IDs are harder to keep unique. One emerging trend is to use an opaque base identifier with lucid or non-opaque extensions. That can be okay because extensions are more transient than the base thing itself. For example, um, you have an object uh, and its image thumbnails are regularly upgraded to be of higher resolution. This happens every few, year, few years to keep up with evolving demand and advances in storage capacity and network and rendering speeds. This slide lists uh, some of the tools for generating opaque IDs, but I won't be getting into them. Back to the details of ARC syntax, um, the special characters slash and period uh, or dot have reserved meanings in ARC suffixes. So that makes these characters effectively non-opaque if you choose to use them. They help the recipient make inferences about one resource containing another or one resource being a variant of another. In any other PID or other non-ARC URL, you could guess at similar interpretations, but in ARC-based URLs, the guesswork, the guesswork is gone. If you use the reserved characters, you are formally declaring that these relationships exist. 
So while the last linked data rule about including links to other URIs to help people discover more things, uh, while that rule is routinely honored in the ARC metadata, it is always honored implicitly by ARC syntax and its suffix conventions. That the slashes represent hierarchy that a client can expect to traverse. Uh, and the periods represent resource variants like JPEG, PDF, uh, .doc, et cetera. So those are variants that a client can expect to elide uh, to receive a default representation. And then there are privileged query parameters uh, known as inflections, such as the question mark info, which can be can, which can predictably transform any given URI to a give to a set of additional protocol reasonable requests. For example, the simple existence of an arc with an internal slash implies the existence of another containing object identified by its parent and obtained by truncating the original arc at the slash. There's a natural parallelism between arc suffixes and the popular IIIF image uh, API, which is gaining traction in domains that have lots of images, such as medical research, museums, and botanical gardens. IIIF works well for addressing hierarchical uh, subregions and variants. This leads to the next case study, this time for the French National Library. Again, its NAN is 12148. Shown here is a long IIIF compliant URL. Looking at the bold part and reading from left to right in the bold part, we can start from the end, uh, the end of the opaque base ID. We can see the page number F29 between slashes, followed by a comma separated list of coordinates that request the return of a specific rectangular region. After that, you can see the request specifying full quality and the JPEG format. ARCs are very flexible. You can throw them away when something doesn't work out, which makes it much easier if you have never told anyone about them. So if you don't tell anyone about your ARCs, it's as if they never happen. ARC metadata is also uniquely flexible. You can start with none, and you can add anything, such as whatever is defined in schema.org. Uh, another example, there are lots of ARCs with data site DOI metadata. You could assign an ARC to something that doesn't exist, because in the planning phase, things need identifiers just so we can start talking about them. You know, after all, we name our children before they're born sometimes. At the moment of birth, when we've created a thing, there might be no metadata, perhaps, because, uh, perhaps except for a redirection target. Later, we can gradually add draft metadata, which might be reviewed and edited by others through various phases of pre-release, preprint, actual print, post-print, etc. So an arc should lead to three things: to the identified thing to metadata about it, answering the basic questions of who, what, and when, and to a, a nuanced persistent statement to set expectations for returning visitors. Here's an example showing an ARC metadata request, which is created by appending a query string consisting of question mark info. The last line in this particular record says that persistence information is unavailable. The question mark info ending is an example of an arc inflection. An inflection is a grammatical device to modify the meaning of a word by making small changes to the end of the original word. One advantage is that you don't have to assign and manage completely separate identifiers, both for the object and for its metadata. Instead, just inflect the original arc. Persistence is not on or off. It is nuanced because, ironically, preservation often involves change. 
Valuable objects tend to be complex, human-managed clusters of digital artifacts that curators are forced to change in order to keep up with changing technical policy, security, and legal requirements, as well as with user expectations. So we're now into the sort of green or uh, less mature uh, part of this talk, which is about proposing terms for these persistent statements. This is still uh, not, not formalized yet, but there was a paper we wrote which proposed terms uh, for various dimensions of change. One is content variance. Another is for object availability. Another is the stability of the identifier itself. And another dimension is provider stability. These are all important ingredients in assessing anybody's persistence promise. So let's now take a, a whirlwind tour of some of the terms we propose. These are all jargon terms, so they could be a little bit odd at times. We don't want to conflict too much with existing terminology. Uh, if we use a term that's too familiar, some of them are meant to be you know, unconventional to remind you that they're jargon. That way you don't assume you know exactly what it means the first time you hear it, but instead you might have to stretch a little bit. So we define content variance to be the way the ways in which provider policy or practice anticipates how an object's content will change over time. In this list, uh, each term encompasses the content variance of the previous term. So for example, uh, keeping. For keeping, the previously recorded content will not change, but character encodings, compression, and markup may change during a format migration. And the high priority and high priority security concerns will be acted upon. For example, a software where virus decontamination uh, or security patching. This could apply to long-term stable software releases, which are, although long-term stable, are routinely patched. Uh, and that's considered to be a service while preservation is occurring. The last line is molting. It's used for persistent access to things that are could be very persistent in terms of reliably getting there, like to a home page, which is uh, persistently the home page for Harvard University Library, or it could be to a weather feed, where the the, the content is changing quite often in terms of um, in terms of years or, or, or even days. We define object availability to be how long a provider intends to keep the object itself. So for example, here is sub-infinite, which is jargon, meaning that due to a succession policy, the object is expected to be available beyond the provider's or provider organization's lifetime. We don't use infinite for obvious reasons but sub-infinite approaches the intent. An important and separate dimension of content variance is growth. Constant growth is often seen as an extremely difficult problem in uh, citing dynamic content. Uh, for example, a data set that is updated every six seconds. But if a provider can declare that growth, growth that merely adds content to the end of otherwise stable information, the problem becomes tractable. So if we can have a term for that, we call that waxing as a, a kind of growing where the, con the existing content is stable. So anyone can promise anything, but we might value a promise from one source more than from another. Who is the provider? What is its mission? Does it have a succession plan if it holds? Everyone talks about versioning, but no one does anything about it. So why not talk about it some more, but maybe with clearer terminology? So here's some possibilities. Extraversioned. Extraversioned content means version the version identifier is separate from the ID string. Not always helpful, but at least a human can detect something. Introversioned content means the version identifier is part of the ID string. An introversion with an O means the it's introversioned, uh, but uh, the, the version identifier 
is actually opaque within so that's the version identifier contained in the object identifier string is opaque. There's been a debate for a long time about requiring PIDs to cite a landing page rather than a directly usable PDF image spreadsheet, etc. This is a painful choice. It often seems as if either you give up metadata access or you give up direct PID access to content by sending everyone to a landing page. Both outcomes are kind of terrible. Um, this is only hypothetical for ARCs so far, but imagine if we could standardize inflections for a landing page versus uh, something called a plunging page. Every server can already provide either one of these experiences. So why not add a way for users to ask for which experience they want explicitly? The server could be queried to return for a given identifier, either a landing page experience or an immersive sub-landing page experience. This seems like the best of both worlds. So why are these terms in blue? Well, that's to transition to, that's um, because there's something called the yams.net vocabulary building tool. I'll talk about it shortly. It's being used to publicize and get feedback on these terms. For the, the terms to be machine readable, they first have to become metadata. So this use case describes the yams.net system that is supported by the Metadata Research Center at Drexel University. Note that the NAN here is more than a number. It has extra characters on the end, namely a slash h1. This is a kind of an extend, this kind of extended NAN is known as a shoulder. ARCs are useful for vocabulary terms or concept IDs because any investment in linked data is more protected with permalinks. Concept IDs are good for things like spreadsheet column header names or variable names, controlled values under those names, relationships, pick list values, and so on. Thousands of work groups across the world are inventing vocabulary or modifying, or modifying existing terms, but they don't have easy ways to share and get feedback on changes. YAMS was created by Dublin Core Metadata Insiders who saw a need for an aggressively domain agnostic tool that helps people share, discuss, and reach consensus quickly on whatever metadata profile they're working on. So we built this crowdsourced metadata dictionary called YAMS. It lets anyone look up terms to reference. You can also log in to comment on other people's terms. You can also upvote or downvote terms and watch them so you get notified if they change. This term is labeled vernacular class, which means it can be changed by the owner. The terms labeled canonical class are done changing. There are also deprecated terms, but they too will always be available because historical documents will always be available. You can add your own term and immediately walk away with an ARC persistent identifier to reference it. There's no problem creating multiple terms with, with the same string. This one has 13 alternates, but each alternate will have a unique ARC concept identifier. You can also add tags to terms and import terms in bulk via a CSV file. Finally, for, for those of you who've been craving a philosophy slide, here you go. Let's consider that a what a persistent identifier string can tell us, here represented by these 26 characters. Is it data? Is it an identifier? Is it an opaque identifier? We can't tell much by looking at it, but it's useful if someone associates it with something. An identifier is really an opinion. It depends on who you ask. In other words, on which name authority you ask. If it is an identifier, it would be terribly helpful if it were inside a URL such as this one. That's because the domain name early in every URL is actually a name authority. And the HTTPS out in front means you can query the authority implied by that domain using a web browser. When we do that, what comes back is a web page explaining that the string is an example, is an example identifier. What we won't see is that behind the scenes, the browser received a 404 not found error. So this modified string looks like a URL, but even though the browser displays a page, according to the official query status, 
it is not an identifier. Maybe someone else has an opinion. Let's change to a different authority. In this case, the DOI.org domain. This third string looks like a proper PID. In fact, it's a DOI, right? Well, no. When we click on it, we see a web page that tells us a 404 not found error occurred. The DOI system has no knowledge of it. And so even though it looks like a PID, it's not a valid identifier. OK, so let's try again, but using a different sub-authority within the DOI.org domain. This time, a browser returns a web page with no 404 error. We now have a valid, uh, true valid DOI. So this should identify trustworthy, citable, scholarly content, right? Well, wrong. In fact, it identifies a kid's movie. That's because it was created by a registration agency that assigns a DOI to every movie made in the United States. The point is that you can assume very little about an object or its persistence by looking at its so-called persistent identifier. If it looks like a PID, that is only a suggestion. What you get back also depends on when you ask. The query experiences described for this slide were made in early 2024. Persistence is not conferred by a string, prefix, or syntax. That's true whether you're dealing with ARCs, DOIs, handles, URNs or any URL-based permalinks. Tools for building for implementing ARCs can be found in the resources area of the ARC Alliance website. They include mentors for generating unique uh, opaque strings, resolvers, plugins, and an ARC service for library administrators. Uh, one uh, recent addition to the tool set is this ARClet hyphen frick. Uh, uh, resolver and Mentor, which is looking very promising. Frick is uh, produced by the Frick Collection uh, developers, and I encourage people to look at that. Suffix pass-through is a feature that a web server can choose to support in order to greatly increase the number of identifiers that it can forward. It dramatically reduces the burden of maintaining identifiers by permitting one identifier to stand in for millions. The way it works, given a URL for the stored identifier, if an ARC arrives with an appended suffix, NTT will re-append it, pass it through to the destination during resolution. This is critical for IIIF applications so that the many addressable subparts and formats don't all have to be separately registered, maintained, and possibly paid for. This final case study uses a visualization from Davy Glace of the U.S. National Science Foundation iSamples project. It allows us to visit the South Pacific island of Morea in French Polynesia. Each of the colored points represents a physical sample, and the towers indicate that many samples were collected at the same location. Each sample point has an ARC identifier, which is displayed when mousing over it. Clicking on one of the points brings up summary metadata, which allows you to link back to the original collection. Following that link to the Smithsonian, you can find more details about the specimen with cross-references to analyses, publications, and other material. The interlinking is done with millions of ARCs, and the number of participating collections should grow significantly as the project continues. It's all part of the NSF iSamples project, which assigns identifiers to biological specimens, rocks, and archaeological artifacts. For a little review, uh, identifiers are like keys. Um, I was hoping I could just like close that and just roll it over. Oh. Using, uh, using locksmith jargon, the left hand end, the part you hold on to, helps to make the key actionable. Keys of the same type begin in the same way on the left hand end. The right hand end contains information unique to individual keys. Keys can open things and give you access. So um, this is another view of the keys, the PID types all having the same basic structure, but with a little more 
speaky detail using the locksmith jargon, which shows up in if you're applying for a uh, an arc uh, for a man. So complete with the, the shoulder and the blade and the tip. So I'm going to skip through this. So in conclusion, what do 10, what do 10 national libraries, 145 universities, 184 archives, 90 museums, and 75 journals all have in common? They're all registered to use ARCs, open mainstream, non-paywalled persistent identifiers that you can start creating in under 48 hours. The ARC Alliance uh, was formed in 2018 to sustain the ARC infrastructure, and we welcome input and volunteers for our working groups, technical outreach, advisory, and the NAN record curation uh, groups. I'm also happy to announce the creation of a brand new ARC email forum for speakers of Spanish and Portuguese, which complements our existing uh, um, forums in English and in French. So I'm ready to pause here uh, for questions. I don't think we gotten questions yet in the Slack. It's an amazing presentation, John. I mean, I just want to read this the slides like a book. <laughs> Thank you. And I also enjoyed Ceci n'est pas en page. <laughs> I forgot where I, I forget where I stole that from. <laughs> um John, I'm curious. So um you, you may have covered this and I just missed it, but um how is it that uh, institutions that do have resolvable ARCs have that set up, but is there sort of a protocol or a specific set of guidelines or do they all kind of do their own different setup for resolving their, their ARCs? Um, they tend to go their own way, especially the early adopters. Um, that it's always taken a little bit we, we don't have our completely canned solutions for people. The idea was, well, it's pretty simple, but, and then there's a, an ellipsis, you need some technical staff. And that's not a good enough answer for lots of people. But the answers are getting better and better. That's why I suggested people looking at the arclet frick tool, which is on the resources page at the arcs.org website. The Frick Collection, as you know, is a fine art museum in New York City. Uh, which has fully embraced ARCs. Um, and they've made this open source tool available. It has a couple of rough edges um, and they're gonna, a blog post is imminent. Um, that should make things easier. But there's also um, some, some of the easiest ways to set up, get, get going with ARCs, just to, um, if, you're, um, if you're using OJS, Open Journal System, there's a plugin for ARCs that um, gets you set up right away. It does pretty much every, if you if you can do your publishing uh, anywhere with OJS, uh, that gets you set up. Uh, Archive Space has a actually has a, an ARC offering, one of the few vendors that does that right now. Um, um, I'm looking forward to to the ARC Fricklet is being uh, ArcLet Frick. <laughs> is being uh, adopted by a West African consortium that's going to be providing uh, access for 17 countries in West Africa. Um, and based, based on that tool, um, there's a whole separate tool. So I think I've, I'm wandering away from your question. There is a little bit of setup. Um, there, there's some, some tactical goodies that are, that make it possible to 
do things like have it, you know, point your arcs at your WordPress site. Um, the, again, it's not completely canned or documented, but that's the idea. And we're, we're, we can use help and we invite you all to come help us discover the areas that need documentation, better solutions. We would, that would be wonderful. Well, thank you for the work that you've put in on this, John, for a long time. Uh, it's 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 obviously something that is quietly supporting many things that we take for granted. Um, I have another question, John. Um, I'm curious: um, is there any sort of um, are, is it also the institutions that are minting ARCs kind of just do their own thing or is there ever any, um, like have you ever been aware of institutions where uh, institutions were minting ARCs incorrectly or weren't staying up to date with how to mint them and were uh, creating perhaps like uh, not well-formed ARCs? Yes, that, uh, that does happen. Um... One of the, you know, um, being decentralized uh, does come at, does have a few downsides. And one is that we don't have, for example, an accurate count of how many arcs there are. We have anecdotal evidence that there are at least 8.2 billion. We know that. But um, those are only those people who have chosen to report this to us. So we also don't have uh, really good information, except anecdotally, where people are sort of screwing up, you know, oh, uh, there was an, one organization that thought, oh, it's decentralized. I can assign myself a five-digit number and start minting arts. No, you have to go to the, you want to be registered with the central registry, but that's a one-time visit. You just visit there once and you get that number. So we had to let them know that wasn't going to work. Um, there are um, also cases where people have um, we sort of had to tighten up the specification to make it clear what practices are correct and what aren't. Um, one of the thing, one of the features of the ARC system is the hyphens are permitted in your public in published ARCs, but they are inert. They are um, they are identity inert. In other words, um, it's as if it's as if they you hadn't done them. When they come in, A hyphen B is, means the same thing as, as A, B. Um, the idea is that uh, in the early internet days, especially out in the wild, your identifiers would return to you with hyphens inserted by text formatting operations and inside blogs, et cetera. And they would appear to be broken. And um, uh, users don't really care. They're still going to blame you, even if uh, it was a, it was a word processing program that actually broke the URL. They're going to blame the source of the URL. So we wanted to reduce the, the experience of broken links in, various, in all the ways we could. But some people haven't completely under, onboarded that notion. Um, so we, we're trying to make sure we, we cover that ground, um, that your hyphens need to be identity inert. Try to use the example of a phone number. Well, your hyphens in your phone numbers, but you don't enter them into your keypad. Well, partly because you can't, but it doesn't seem to bother people that um, the hyphens are there for readability, and they are there for readability in a lot of the arcs where you see those UUIDs. But they need to not actually be um, important. If they're elided, it's, it means the same arc as if they're not elided. That's a little confusing for people. Um, but uh, yeah, one of the um, one of the important uh, blockers that I'd love to make some traction, some headway on is this: the creating of these unique strings. 
Um, so the really easy way to do it is with that UUID software, which creates 37 character strings with hyphens and you know hexadecimal. Um, they're way they're way long. They're pretty ugly in citations, but at least they work. There's a, a newer algorithm called ULID, ULID. Um, uh, if you can get that at GitHub, um, it's a more compact encoding, so it reduces it to something like, you know, I, I forget, 28 characters. So it's a little shorter, no hyphens, um, and uh, using a broader, more of the alphabet to create a denser kind of uh, compact form. But you still need, you want the short versions, and to get a short, really short version, the algorithms out there, they require Either you keep a database or you've got something that can detect collisions and then retry with a random number generator. And that's that's a little too hacky. It needs to be boxed up and just put into a little a tool that so nobody has to know how that works or or why. But uh, those are features of the, the Arclet it has its own algorithm. The Noid software, it's like nice opaque identifiers that has that uses a little tiny database for that. Um, but um, it's a little too, still a little bit too painful. Um, we're seeing a, a lot of, uh, this past year we've seen accelerating adoption from the global south, particularly Latin America and, uh, and, and Africa. Um, and uh, this is all pretty exciting because they're, they're really driven by uh, interest in their cost driven. Um, and these are mainly uh, journals, which uh, can't go the traditional publishing route. So, um, thank you so much. That this was wonderful, and uh, I really want to thank you, John, and um, also Jessica and Ryan for uh, making this a great session. Right. I don't, I haven't actually experienced what happens as we turn over into a social hour. So maybe someone can tell me what happens next. Um, well, the, it's a, it's a bit of a story. The, the social, the social subcommittee was maybe going to use social hours for like in synchronous uh, sessions, but they decided to go with Slack, but we just left them on the program. Um, so if there are more questions uh, or discussion we can keep and John wants to stick around we could just extend otherwise um, I don't know if we've gotten um, it looks like we haven't really gotten a lot of additional people joining uh, for the social hour so so in the previous days we just let the discussion carry on and uh i think in on monday uh, i think we rounded out the hour with discussion and then yesterday we ended just a few minutes early so uh, i see yeah so it's up to john do you i don't know if there are more questions though uh I, i'm not seeing things coming in the slack I, I think like a lot of people it's a lot to digest with mm -hmm. this um I know that um, locally uh, there uh, uh, there was a workshop uh, in New York um, by the New York Technical Services uh, Librarians Organization. Sorry, I'm I've shifted to the couch because it's the end of the day. Um, and uh, by uh, Jack O'Malley, who was the at the Frick uh, on minting these and using the Arclet software. And I, but I just checked to see if there were any uh, posted artifacts from that. There is a workshop page, uh, but I was, I'm actually hoping that they offer that again. I sent in feedback because I think Jack tried to show how to use Arclet in maybe an hour and a half. And um, it just was not enough time. So, so I think that we, the, I, I would love to see Jack do that workshop in like a three hour format at some point. I would love to hear him too. He's uh, his blog post is the one that should be coming out in, in imminently. Oh, Jessica, oh. 
noted that uh, Jack is has moved on from the Frick. I am also I'm an alum of the Frick myself, but uh, uh, and Jack Jack came on after after my days, but uh, oh okay, so that's good to know that he's still um, he's still working in the in the linked open data fields. But maybe uh, Lou Johnson, maybe we can, who's still at the Frick, I think maybe he, and seems to have played a role, maybe he would, uh, we could tap him to do a, a longer workshop sometime, at least locally, or maybe for LD4 2025, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't know he's left the Frick, as is uh, important. Uh, mm -hmm. I have to reach out to him. Yeah. Okay, well, I think it's I did I think I think we don't have any more questions um coming in through any of our channels and I don't see folks joining for the social programming uh which is like I said maybe not uh everyone go check out the social channel in the slack um there's some fun prompts and discussions but i think it's maybe a little hard to get people amped up at least east coast time at 5 30 to you know share little tidbits and pictures um that they can do asynchronously in the slack so thank you john this was a great workshop and maybe we can just end the live stream and the zoom a little early today all right. Party on. Thank you so Good. much, everybody. Really appreciate that you inviting me. All right.